Hi, and welcome to the Health Begins with Moms show. I am Dorit Pavanov, your host. On this podcast, I will share insights and interviews on health, parenting, and explore the question of what does it take to thrive as women, wives, and mothers. Now, let's get going with today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of the Health Begins With Mom podcast. Before I get into today's episode, I want to remind you that today's show notes can be found over at my website, healthbeginswithmom.com forward slash EP 36. So if you're new to the show, welcome and thank you so much for spending the next hour or so with me today. My name is Dorit Palvanov and I am your host. The Health Begins With Mom podcast is a weekly show for women, girls, mothers, and families who want to learn how to take back control of their own health and learn how they can feel happy, joyful, and thrive in their bodies. I am not interested in learning how to survive or simply exist in the world unpurposefully. I am on a mission to heal myself, give my three girls the tools and support they need to heal themselves and thrive while doing so. I believe that we are all children of God and God wants us to shine our light onto the world, which is impossible to do if we don't own our life, our light, and if we are not healthy. And health is a big word and I'm very aware of that. And being healthy is great, but should never be a simply a means to an end. Health is a feeling. Health is simply the best state of being when you can allow yourself to be a vessel of light and shine your light on people who need you to show up as the very best version of yourself. This is what we do here. So if this message resonates with you, I am pumped to have you to join this ride with me. So before we get into today's interview, I have a quick announcement to make. I'm opening the doors to my signature four-week program, Teach Your Kids to Eat Vegetables, which is all about teaching you how to feed your kids healthfully with more love, compassion, understanding, good sense, and no pressure. As parents, we want the best for our children. We want our child to grow healthy and live up to his or her potential. And at the end of the day, we want to give them a good start in life. But before jumping to big ideas like helping them live up to their potential, potential, which is great, can we all agree that keeping them alive is a challenge on its own? I mean, one of the most challenging responsibilities of a parent is to feed our children. But what do you do when they refuse food? When she or he can go days on end without eating or eating very little? So does this sound familiar to you? You have carved out the time to make a beautiful, nutritionally balanced meal for your family. And then there is always this child who does not want to eat it. How about this? Your child routinely eats very little, which you find to be worrisome. Or your child doesn't want to sit at the table and he keeps, he or she keeps jumping up and down and not honoring the idea of sitting down to eat or how about if your child eats very slowly and you find it extremely annoying right how about um a scenario like this you have to use distractions things like tv phone toys etc to keep your child engaged and interested in food Or what if you have to to run around after your child because that's the only way he or she will eat. So there's so many things that our kids um, that our kids do, and it really is. First of all, could be worrisome. Second, it could be just simply annoying. And I think, and I'm a huge believer. And if you've been following me for a while, you know that I also have a picky eater, and. I do this work because of her, (laughs) you know, so there are so many things that I have learned um, as a conscious parent, you know, and uh, a lot of things in psychology that I have implemented with my own parenting. And it just helped me so much in this 
not so easy task of feeding my child. So in the holiday spirit, I cre- the, this course that I created, Teach Your Kids to Eat Vegetables, it's a, it's a course that is designed for parents of picky eaters. And I offer this cor- course a 30% discount. And you can find more information about this in the show notes. Um, you can find them either on iTunes, Stitcher, or on my website. So the link is, again, healthbeginswithmom.com forward slash ep dash 34 so regularly i sell this course it's a four-week course private uh, coaching course with me um and it's usually sold for 5.99 canadian now i offer it for 419 canadian and so if you're from the u.s it comes out to be about 325 dollars u.s All right. So I really hope you if you've been sort of on the fence with this kind of with this kind of course, now is your time. Right. So it's a great course for parents who are tired of food battles and using food as a reward or punishment. And I believe that food is life's greatest pleasures. And as parents, we can give this gift to our children. And the gift, this is the gift of having a positive relationship with food. So if you have any questions regarding this course, please feel free to email me at Dorit, D-O-R-I-T, at healthbeginswithmom.com. Or you can also send me a private message on Facebook. I go under Dorit Palina. All right, so let's get into today's show. I'm so excited for today's episode. Finally, it is happening. Today's guest is someone I have been thinking about sharing with the world even before the podcast was in the plans. You guys know that I'm a strong believer that in order to thrive in this human experience, we have to learn how to regulate our emotions. Human beings are emotional beings and emotions play a huge role when it comes to healing as well. True healing is only possible when we take back control of our own health, when we stop looking outside of ourselves for someone to heal or save us. Whether this someone is a doctor, a nutritionist, a health coach, chiropractor, or a psychic, as a human being, you have access to an unbelievable powerhouse, which is your body and energy. And when you know how to work with it and live your life in alignment with the laws of nature, then and only then can you truly heal yourself. Imagine how powerful that would be if you taught your kids to do the same. My goal with this podcast is to introduce you to the people, practitioners, and leaders from the world of alternative health and wellness that can help you take the first steps on this journey. I want you to educate yourself so that you can pass on this lost wisdom to your children and future generations so we can stop unnecessary suffering and start tapping more easily into health, abundance, well-being, vitality, so we can stop to just exist or survive through our days and instead thrive as women, wives, and mothers. So Dr. Uh, Alvin D. Leon is my guest today, and he is a father of two uh, and a natural health practitioner and a licensed chiropractor. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from York University with combined honors in psychology and kinesiology. He graduated magna cum laude from New York Chiropractic College in 2002 and has since continued to educate himself on various mind-body therapies. It was during this journey that Dr. Alvin first learned about Dr. Hammer's research on the science of GNM, German New Medicine, and the five biological laws. He began his GNM studies in 2008 and has since fully integrated GNM into his clinic practice. With over 15 years of clinical experience, he has helped thousands of people understand the emotional component of their physical symptoms so that they can have relief and get back to doing what they love. Since 2009, Dr. Alvin has been giving monthly GNM presentations in the Vaughan, Ontario region, as well as online GNM webinars. His goal is to help reduce people's health fears and to empower them to be the experts of their bodies. And just a quick <clears throat> insert from me uh, I've met Dr. Alvin about three years ago in one of the business uh, summits. Um, 
I think it was in Toronto. And when I heard about this approach, I immediately was so curious and I uh, attended his live workshops and um, just uh, re started researching more and more about this approach. And guys, since then, I am... Uh, like I, I just practice it this is I apply it I use it and this is how I help my kids to heal and this is how I have this is what I use to heal myself when I have uh, health issues and challenges and I'm telling you this this is in my belief this is the right way to approach our health and wellness and well-being so here's what we cover on the show we talk about uh, what is GNM. It's also known as German New Medicine and why it is so important for parents. We talk about why food should not be used as a cause for illness or diseases and what's the right approach to food according to GNM. We talk about the five biological laws. Um, we also talk about how uh, to explain cancer according to GM GNM. Uh, we also get into talking about um, drugs and antibiotics and fever fever lowering medicine. And we talk about uh, is it even necessary according to this new health approach. We talk about chiropractic or other health, um, healing modalities and uh, if they're even necessary when someone is applying this uh, GNM method. Um, we also talk about how to manage febrile seizures and um, also, obviously, we talk about what the skeptics say about GNM because this is a fairly new approach to health and well-being. So I know this is something new. Um, this is by far one of my favorite interviews. I cannot wait for you to hear uh, Dr. Alvin to just learn more about this um, this approach to health. And so, yeah, so without further ado, let's jump right into my conversation with Dr. Alvin DeLeon. Hey, Alvin, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you doing, Dorit? I'm good. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, so before we jump into today's in conversation, um, can you tell us, since this podcast is for parents, uh, what are you currently loving about being a father right now? Oh my goodness. What am I currently loving about being a father? Well, I've got two uh, children, an eight-year-old daughter and uh, just turned 12-year-old son. And I'd have to say really um, the most amazing thing for me as a father is observing their natural inclination. Like I really am in awe of, of what comes out of them from a, either just a thought process or a skill set. Like I'm amazed at my daughter's uh, rock climbing abilities that I don't know where that comes from, but it's just inside her or my son's ability to listen to music and play from his ear, you know, just that natural talent. So I think for me, the fun thing is just sort of being part of that process and just observing like, okay, what are they going to say next? What's going to come out of these two human beings that, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to witness and observe. So, so that's been a fun process for me lately. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I experienced the same things with my kids. So you and I, we have a pretty similar story when it comes to how we came to do the work that we do in the world. Both of us experienced um, febrile seizures with our kids. <laughs> and so I'd love for us to start by telling the listeners how it all started for you and why you do the work that you do. Well, um, you know, my background as a chiropractor naturally and not just uh, your conventional chiropractor, I, I had my background was in pediatrics. Uh, I did a fellowship for a year after graduating in pediatrics. So I was working with pregnant uh, parents. I was, you know, my goal was to learn as much as I could in terms of raising a healthy family before we had our own child. And as you can imagine, uh, you know, doing everything that you can do to, to raise a healthy child, following all the right recommendations, nutritionally, uh, lifestyle wise, uh, when my son was probably just before two years old, um, he was sick with a fever, nothing unusual. He's had fevers before, some lasting two, three, four days, not a big deal. This one lasted a day, and uh, while my mom was babysitting him during that day, I remember checking in on him to see how he was doing because, you know, you could tell he's lethargic, he's on the couch, not feeling well. And as I turn around to leave, I hear my mom scream and I turn around and I see Noah having a, a seizure like right there in, in front of my eyes. And, you know, as a parent, you know, holding your child while yeah. they're having that seizure is like the scariest, the scariest thing, helpless. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it was probably 30 to 45 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. Right. Um, and I remember just, you know, the thoughts that, that go through your, your head at that moment. Uh, and the funny thing is, I remember a friend of mine who's a nurse telling us, you know, in, in a barbecue, like a couple of months prior that, you know, she sees all these parents that have kids that get brought to the hospital with febrile seizures. And a lot of the times, the kids are fine by the time they get to the hospital, that there's nothing to do. And so, you know, even though I knew that when your child is going through it, um, it really messes with you, uh, your emotions. And I remember taking him to the ER, uh, barely able to drive. When he came out of that seizure, he was crying. Uh, he was okay by the end, but I had to get the, the paramedics to meet us at a gas station because I couldn't even drive him. I was so uh, rattled by the entire thing. Uh, and in the end, everything was okay. You know, as you know, they, they do their own checkups, the blood work, the hospital, everything was fine. They said, well, you have a child that's going to be maybe prone to febrile yeah. seizures, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of disheartening as a natural health practitioner. I thought we'd done everything right. We, you know, we're introducing all these like proper foods, uh, avoiding all these toxins and chemicals in his body. And, and yet we have a child that's going to have seizures. And, mm -hmm. and so that was a real uh, turning point for me because it made me really you know, question what I was doing, like, how am I supposed to help my patients and their families to be healthy if I couldn't keep my own family healthy? And it was really that uh, soul searching that prompted me to make a decision that, you know what, just because I don't know the answers right now, it doesn't mean it's not out there somewhere for me to uncover. And that's really what started my journey. I was relentless. I kept looking, I kept studying, questioning what I was learning. And it was really on that process around 2000 and Eight that I discovered or learned about Dr. Hammer's research on GNM or German New Medicine. And my life's never been the same uh, ever since that moment. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. I, I can't wait to, to, you know, talk to you more about this and expose more people to this. So <clears throat> I just want to tell you that I love your story so much because usually we hear about quote, quote, you know, conventional doctors who learn through their own experiences that the current medical system is not equipped enough or it is not in alignment with how the body actually works. But your story is super compelling because you are someone we call an, an alternative practitioner who is supposedly have to have the answers, right? Exactly. And that, believe me, it wasn't fun to go through that period of your life where you're thinking, like, if I didn't know, I, I did my fellowship, I did pediatrics, I specialized, and yet I don't have the answers. Like, you know, and it was a real gut wrenching period of my life. But you know what, looking back, it, it was, uh, it was a huge, uh, you know, it was a huge moment of, of being grateful that I went through it as well. Right. Okay. So let's talk about this new health perspective. It's called GNM, right? German New Medicine. Yes. And let's also, I want to gear it towards why it's so important for families, for parents, to, you know, raising small kids to know about this. Yes. Um, so yeah, pretty much uh, German New Medicine or GNM, it's based on Dr. Hammer's research coming out of Germany. Uh, he's been involved in this research, working with his patients, looking at all of their brain scans, and then interviewing them about how they were interpreting or experiencing unexpected conflict shocks, unexpected events in their lives. And so he pretty much came up with what he calls the five biological laws, which really um, is what sets GNM apart from all other natural sciences or natural um, um, paradigms of health. And the basis of it and why I think it's so valuable and as you mentioned, so important, not just you know, for the average person, but for parents to be able to, to understand what their children are dealing with and what they can do about it. Um, you know, the, base, the basis of what people need to know is that you cannot have a symptom happening at the organ level without the brain being involved because the brain controls every organ in the body. And it's only because Dr. Hammer took brain scans that he was able to map out that, you know, he would find these sharp target rings on the brain scan and he would say every single person that would have this skin rash will have these rings in the same area of the brain known as the sensory cortex. Not 70 or 80% of them, 100% of them. Every single per person that had stomach pain or digestive issues will have these rings in the brain stem, in a particular area of the brain stem. So he started really mapping out the brain. But then he factored in a really important aspect, which most of us are not really diving into, even though we're aware that it affects our health. And that's what's happening to us at an emotional level. 
uh, more importantly, how we experience unexpected conflict, unexpected events. Dr. Hammer calls these conflict shocks or a DHS. It stands for Dirk Hammer syndrome. And what he said that is that when we have an unexpected event in our lives, an unexpected change in routine, an unexpected comment, criticism, or circumstance, we all subconsciously and subjectively perceive that as a particular theme. It could be an abandonment, a separation, an anger, a fear. And depending on how you perceive it in a split second, it will create an impact somewhere on the brain that's actually measurable on the brain scan. And wherever that impact goes in the brain, it will initiate changes at the organ controlled from that area of the brain in order to assist that person in dealing with that unexpected and emotionally distressing situation. So this is fascinating because now we start looking at each person, each child as a biological unit. We don't just look at them as an emotional being and, and treat the emotion or a neurological uh, being and just treat the brain or just an organ and treat those uh, parts of the body. We look at them as a biological unit comprised of a psyche, a brain, and an organ. So when you have a child that is dealing with uh, a symptom, all of a sudden they have stomach pain and they have diarrhea and you're wondering like, how did this happen? Uh, they didn't eat anything out of the norm. If you understand the five biological laws and Dr. Hammer's research of GNM, you're going to realize, okay, these symptoms are related to this part of the brain and that part of the brain is related to an unexpected event that they perceived as an indigestible morsel or indigestible anger, something that they couldn't digest, they couldn't accept, they mm -hmm. couldn't absorb. I wonder what that could be. And then you start to look that, oh, interesting that their stomach pain, their diarrhea showed up after you know, they got in trouble at school and had to get separated from their best friend. It's interesting that their stomach pain and digestive issues started to show up the moment we're getting separated, the parents are getting separated or getting a divorce, or the moment they have to move the child to a new school because there's bullying. So as a parent, we start to realize that the symptoms that our children are showing up with are actually based on how they are subconsciously and subjectively perceiving these unexpected conflict or unexpected uh, emotionally distressing situations in their day-to-day -day lives. So that's huge because as you know, most of the time, and, and I went through it, you know, with my son, he was, it was about two or three years old. That's how old he was when I learned about GNM. So my daughter was fully raised with the knowledge of GNM, whereas my son, it was about two, three years later before I could apply it to him. And, and what a difference because you finally, as a parent, feel empowered that you understand why your child is dealing with this symptom and what you can do about it. Right. And I can tell you that since I've heard you speak about this, I think it was uh, three years ago, mm -hmm. we, my husband and I, we've been practicing and trying it out and it actually works. And I think the best, at least what, you know, the what we've gained the most out of it is this, you know how you feel guilty as a parent, especially when they're very little, it's like, Oh, I've, you know, it's, they're having this because I did something or I fed them with something, you know, or, um, whatever, like you feel <laughs> that sense of guilt, guilt but yes. yeah. And then when I learned about this and that, that that piece when you mentioned that you know it's about how they are perceiving the world and that actually is the reason why they are having their own response to you know to that perception it is so liberating as a parent exactly. right it's, exactly. it's it's like it's so great and and that's that's a great point that you bring up right because and it's important for your audience to to hear this is that in the beginning, when you first learned this, so you're saying that, you know, my, my daughter's uh, diarrhea and stomach pain, and now she's diagnosed with a gluten intolerance and she's got colitis, is because I moved her to a new house in a new neighborhood. Then they feel guilty, right? But this is what I tell parents, and that's how it's natural, normal to feel that in the beginning. But exactly what you just mentioned is that we as parents cannot predict how our children will Perceive, perceive yeah any unexpected event so you really i mean it's hard enough for you to determine how you experience something unexpected let alone how your three kids are going to experience it right so this is what i always um mention to people that instead of feeling guilty you actually feel liberated empowered that you now get to know each child and one of my classic examples is you can have three children 
And when you tell them now it's winter here in Toronto, it's like, listen, if you don't get your boots and your coat on right now, I'm going to leave you because we're going to be late. And you could scream and yell that and threaten your kids that you're going to leave them if they don't hurry up. One child could actually hear that as uh, take it at face value. Oh my gosh, they could feel an actual separation conflict because I don't want to be separated from my mom that they're really going to leave me. And that's a shock for them that affects the part of the brain that controls the skin. You can have another child that can actually experience that as a fear. I'm scared to be left alone. I can't believe they're going to leave me. And that can impact the part of the brain that affects the bronchial or the larynx. And then you can have another child that, yeah, right, you're going to leave us. I don't care. And they don't even get a shock. Right. So when you have those three kids a week later, a few days later, one kid breaks out with a skin rash, another child with a chronic cough, and another child with no symptoms, you start to, with the knowledge of GM, understand the vulnerabilities and sensitivities of your children. So now you know that child number three doesn't care. She gets no symptoms. She's not afraid. She's not scared of being separated. I can yell and threaten her all I want. She never gets affected. Child number two. Two is very sensitive to separation or to uh, or is very sensitive to feeling like she's going to left be, be left behind and she gets a skin rash that breaks out every now and then. And child number one could be uh, somebody that has a lot of fears. And so he always has a chronic cough or he's now got asthma symptoms. So you start to realize that I got to talk to each child a little bit differently knowing what their sensitivities are. To me, that's the ultimate conscious parenting. Yeah. And so absolutely. as you know, as your audience is listening, this is how empowered you feel. You realize that I can be harder on number three. I got to be a little cautious and maybe more descriptive for number two. And I can't even bring it up with number one. And that's how you start to treat your, your uh, children based on their needs. Yeah. And you know, I have to ask you this question because you know, I come from the world of food and nutrition. So, and you know, there is this I think one of the worst things to teach and educate parents about food is when, and I think, I, I don't know if you remember this, but we had that conversation back then, back when, um, and it's about how, let's say dairy, you know, if you eat dairy, you're, you know, it's going to cause this and this symptom, or if you eat too much of this, too much of candy, too much this, like, you know, th this, this is going to cause that whatever the symptom. So yes. what do you have to say about, you know, how, where is GNM um, sort of, how, how can that resolve that kind of conflict for parents? Well, and this is a very sensitive topic, as you can imagine. I have a lot of friends that are nutritionists, that are naturopaths, that are homeopaths, where really the basis of a lot of the therapies are based on food elimination, on cleanses, on sort of cleaning up the diets, right? And I, you know, I get it. Uh, it is important for us to eat clean, to avoid certain chemicals, to, to eat as, as clean as we can, have a variety, eat locally. All those things are great. Why? Because they give us energy. They raise our energy. Now, one of the things that differentiates the GNM perspective when it comes to food is that the fifth biological law actually states that every so-called disease or biological program comes about because it's a meaningful and significant biological process in assisting that organism in dealing with an emotionally distressing situation or an unexpected event. So these symptoms that we experience, that skin rash, that cough, that stomach pain, it serves a biological purpose in helping that organ that's affected to function better until that person is no longer in that stress state or that conflict is resolved. So when you look at the body as an intelligent organism, when you appreciate that there's these built-in mechanisms that's assisting the body in healing, then we start to realize that this idea that eating poorly or introducing quote-unquote bad foods into the system is causing a disease doesn't fly. Because now we look at diseases as meaningful biological processes that something unexpectedly happened that shocked you. So now where does this put this whole concept around eating and nutrition when it comes to GM. Well, as you mentioned, as a parent, you focus less on what they're consuming from a food perspective, and you focus more of your energy on how they're responding emotionally to unexpected events, which to me is liberating, number one, because as you said, you can read 
you can get overwhelmed with all of the content online, uh, in, in all sorts of blogs and all sorts of media telling you the right thing to feed, how much of the right thing, one minute, you know, strawberries could cause these skin allergies the next minute. Well, but you need strawberries because they contain certain, uh, you know, carotenoids, flavonoids that are important for the body. And so it's, it's, it can get overwhelming and confusing, but instead of focusing on that, Yes, you still want your child to eat healthy, to eat in moderation, to use common sense, but you're now conscious of their emotional state if they get a symptom after an unexpected event, after a change in routine. And to me, in terms of long-term relationship developing, you will actually have a better connection with your child because you know how they hear things. You how they perceive things, you know how they're interpreting things in their day-to-day lives. And if you're a conscious parent and you're willing to put in the effort, you can actually cater to your child's vulnerabilities that allows them to feel understood. Mom gets me that she doesn't yell at me about these things, even though she yells at my brother about that. Because I know that if she yelled at me, I would feel so devalued. I would feel, you know, like I'm the worst person on earth when she does that. And those types of conflicts could lead to joint pain or juvenile arthritis. And so you start to see how it's so important uh, in terms of just connecting with your child when you focus less on what they're eating, more on how they're experiencing these unexpected events based on the symptoms that they present with. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, the five biological laws. And I feel like, you know, I think in order for, pe- for people who are listening to sort of create that kind of structure and um, understanding, can we talk about them? Can you mention them? Sure, sure. So, we, you know, I'll do a little a quick encapsulation of the five biological laws. I just mentioned the fifth one. Well, the first biological law states that every so-called disease is actually a biological program that's initiated by an unexpected conflict shock that will impact the brain and will cause changes at the organ level. So again, whatever symptoms we are experiencing all originate from how we subconsciously and subjectively in a split second perceive an unexpected event. Okay, so that's the first biological law. Doesn't matter what symptom your child has, if they're having a cough, you start thinking, okay, they must have experienced an unexpected event, You could look it up on the website. What does cough mean? Oh, that's a scare fright. Great. Something happened that scared them. If they have a skin rash, what does that mean? That's a separation. Something happened that they perceived as a separation or fear of separation. What stomach pain and diarrhea? Oh, that's an anger. Something happened that made them angry. So you now start to realize that the symptoms originate from an unexpected conflict shock. That's the first biological law. The second biological law, which is really important, is the law of two phases. It states that every biological program once you have a conflict shock, runs in two phases. The first phase is a stress phase, known as the conflict active phase. During this phase, you already have the impact in the brain, you already have the changes in the organ, but 80, 90% of the time, you do not feel those changes. Okay, the only thing that we can observe during this conflict active state is that the child seems stressed. How do we know? Their blood vessels constrict when they're stressed, so they're gonna have cold hands and cold feet. So when your child has cold hands and cold feet and you're, you're inside a warm house, it's probably highly likely, especially when they're a baby, that they're conflict active. There's something's happened that stressed them already. Okay, so that's the first phase. They could have interrupted sleep in the first phase. They wake up at one or two in the morning, can't fall back asleep. They don't have much of an appetite. You're having a problem feeding them. And like I said, they've got cold hands and cold feet, but they have lots of energy during the conflict active phase. So most of the time, because our current model of health doesn't have two phases, we think everything's fine, right? Because there's not a lot of symptoms in the conflict active phase. The moment the conflict gets resolved, they now enter the second phase, which is the healing phase. And just like anything in the body that's healing, right? When you sprain your ankle, you get a cut, fluid goes to the area that's healing. The fluid going to that area will create, create swelling, inflammation, pain, discharge and this is when the symptoms start to show up so the healing phase is actually when most of our symptoms show up the diarrhea comes in the healing phase the cough comes in the healing phase the rash comes in the healing phase it's also in the healing phase that because of the blood vessels constricting in the active phase now that they relax the blood vessels dilate 
Now you have warm hands, warm feet. Now they have a fever. Okay, so most of the symptoms that we know of, the headaches, the dizziness, the lightheadedness, the pain, all happen in the healing phase. The fever, the fatigue starts to kick in. And then by the end of that healing phase, they start to get their appetite back. So again, it's important to understand those two phases because most of the time we're going to realize that, okay, um, my child just got off the bus and is complaining of stomach pain. That tells me he resolved, because the stomach pain comes in the healing, something that maybe made him angry today at school. So now I can communicate that to him. I say to him, okay, what happened today that made you angry? And as a tip for all you parents, when you're trying to implement this in your life, in your family, no matter what they're going to say when you ask that, that's what it is. So you don't have to say, well, are you sure? Are you? Because you want to train your children to be in control, that they know that, oh, well, what happened at school today? The teacher didn't pick me when I knew the answer. Well, maybe that did make them angry. So you tell them, well, that's why you have your stomach ache. That's why you're having a diarrhea because that means you're not angry anymore because that comes in the healing phase. So now you need to rest. You need to take it easy. You might be tired, but everything's okay now. But do you see what I mean? How that made you angry when the teacher didn't pick you? And they might say, yes. Now you're training them to understand themselves and their body. Okay. That's the second biological law. The third and fourth, I don't go into it too much. It really goes into the science. You know, the third biological law talks about embryology and human evolution as the foundation of medicine. And it, it really goes into the detail of why that part of the brain affects that organ of the body is because they share the same original embryological germ layer. Okay, so it goes more into embryology and, and evolution. Uh, and that's the third biological law. The fourth biological law is the beneficial role of microbes. So that just goes into the fact that in the healing phase, if the body needs to break down tissues that are no longer needed or it needs to repair ulcerations that happened in the conflict active phase, bacteria serves a role in doing that. So bacteria are beneficial in helping us during the healing phase of any biological program. So most of these infections that we're going to be diagnosed with or your kids will be diagnosed with is actually happening in the healing phase. So important to know so that you're not panicking and you can understand sort of, you know, again, your child's vulnerabilities. Whenever it's around Halloween time, they always get a cough. So what is it that they're scared of? What is it that they're sensitive to being scared about? It's not necessarily that lung infection or the viruses or the bugs going around. It's going to be a scare fright, okay? So that's the fourth biological law, the beneficial role of microbes. And the fifth biological law, as I mentioned earlier, it's the fact that all of these biological programs, all of these so-called diseases that we've been uh, educated on are actually meaningful, significant biological programs um, who serves a purpose in assisting the organism in dealing with an emotionally distressing situation. So it makes it that these are not things that we want to avoid or prevent, that these are things that are meaningful, that are actually helping us. Instead of focusing on the symptom, we can now focus our energy on the conflicts and making sure that they're resolved and the body will know how to heal itself properly. I love this. I love this because, you know, it, emp it I, because it empowers us parents to act as detectives instead of feeling powerless, helpless, or get into this fear response. And I think even more so it helps us feel like, you know, a, d a disease is sort of our body's way of communicating with us as opposed to feeling like, you know, I'm completely disconnected from my body right because i think that's it's the huge. approach yeah i think that's the it's approach because yeah sorry it's like what you were saying earlier that like you're gonna have many parents that are tuning into you that are doing everything right right their, their their children are eating organic they're avoiding all sorts of chemicals they're avoiding electromagnetic frequencies they're doing everything right they're they're even teaching them yoga and meditation and positive mental attitude they're doing everything right but they don't understand why around halloween they get a cough you see what I mean? Like, how is this happening? I, I'm doing everything. I'm boosting their immune system. I'm doing everything. They've got vitamins, minerals. They're seeing all sorts of practitioners naturally. And they still get a cough every time it's around October and November, right? How come their body can't deal with it? Well, if you know, Gina, you're realizing, wait a second, something unexpected is happening around that time that's triggering a fear for them. Well, maybe your child is somebody that is sensitive to seeing witches or seeing ghosts or seeing goblins around. 
And you as a parent, when you know this, you become empowered. And it's not the food or the supplements necessarily. It's the fact that I have to make sure that, you know, we don't put up those kind of decorations in our home and trigger the cough every year. So do you see what I mean? Now, yes, as a parent, it makes your life to, to me so empowered and liberated that like you don't have to focus on what everyone else is focusing on. And to be honest, even focusing on those things, it's not really helping. A lot of times people are still unsure of why right. their children are getting sick or getting symptoms, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and, and I love this so much because it helps us to stop using food as a punishment or reward because it's so ridiculous, right? It's, <laughs> it's, and I, and I've seen this again and again and again with the people I work with that kids are literally are afraid of food. They're either yes. afraid of food. So a lot of kids, um, a lot of parents come to me because their kids are unable to gain proper weight or the contrary is true where kids are gaining a lot of weight, which is an indication, right? Cause we get into this emotional um, component of things that it's something they're hiding from probably. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of factors, but like you said, the biggest issue in terms of even the clients that you're probably seeing is that I believe long-term we're priming our children to be disempowered, that their health is an external thing, that there's something out there that will make them healthy and something out there that will make them not healthy. And for me, I believe that that paradigm is wrong. I believe that it's got to come from inside that I want my children to believe that when I quote unquote get sick, it's not because of something I did out there or something I was exposed to. It's because of how I perceived the, something unexpected and that was distressing to me. And then I get to learn about myself. Why did I get angry? Why does that always make me angry? Why does that make me feel abandoned? Why does that make me feel afraid? And now you can work on yourself. And, and I think you know, that's a very powerful thing moving forward is that we as human beings become the experts of our own bodies. And I really believe that that's the shift. Fun the fundamental shift that has to happen is that I don't care how many years experience you have as a practitioner, Dorit. I don't care how many years uh, Al Dr. Alvin's been in practice. I don't care what top doctor in a hospital is telling me about my body they do not know what my body needs because right. they don't live in my body. I know what my body needs. And that level of, of confidence and certainty, I believe we've been taking away from people for many years. And, and this knowledge of GNM now empowers us to know that there's a science behind it, that there's a verification that if you get to know yourself and your sensitivities and your vulnerabilities, and you work on that at an emotional level, you're less likely to get symptoms or your symptoms are less likely to be as severe as somebody who's totally unconscious of that. Right. So Alvin, can you talk about how to apply this approach to more serious dis diseases like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera? Yeah. So, I mean, and this is where it becomes very tricky, right? Because again, Historically, you and I, since we were four or five years old, have been primed with information uh, as to how to be afraid or why we need to be afraid of certain diseases, right? That if you eat this way, you're going to get a heart attack. That if you live a certain way, you're going to get cancer or, you know, so if you don't get checked out, if you don't do this. So it's a real challenge to, to, to shift that perspective. But ultimately, from a GNM perspective, we do not focus on the name of the diagnosed disease. We don't focus on what it's called. We focus on what symptom is that person experiencing because the symptom tells us what organ or tissue is involved. That will tell us what part of the brain gets the impact and that will tell us how they experience an unexpected event. Now, whether that change in the organ of somebody that has an ongoing anger issue for many years is diagnosed as a benign tumor or growth or whether it's diagnosed as a colon cancer is really based on how intense that conflict is for that person. So again, the biological process is a biological process. That growth is there to assist that colon to digest what's been hard to digest for many years. And so 
it's going to produce extra digestive enzymes to digest that figurative morsel that's making that organism angry. And when that anger is no longer there, that extra cells, the benign or malignant tumor will get broken down and eliminated from the body. So again, it's a challenging proposition to look at cancers and diseases this way as triggered by biological uh, conflicts in our lives that, that's been going on for many years that's, that are very intense. But realistically, what's the alternative right now, right? The alternative right now is that either it's your diet, it's genetic, it's environmental, or you got bad luck. And so again, if you look at all of those, it's disempowering, that there's nothing you can do. And so um, whether it's what we would call a serious uh, disease or diagnosis versus a mild one, from a GM perspective, according to Dr. Hammer's research, these are all biological programs that are meaningful in assisting that person in dealing with an unexpected, emotionally distressing situation. In fact, you know, as you research about GM, if you go to the learninggenome.com website, most of Dr. Hammer's original research in 1980-81 was on cancer patients and heart attacks. Most of his verifications were on heart disease. And so, again, it started with the more serious uh, diagnoses, and, it, and he just implemented it for all other uh, issues from skin rashes to, to back pain and neck pain and digestive issues. Mm. And I'm curious, what, what is your take on medication, drugs, antibiotics, or even things like Advil and Tylenol? Because if most of our body's health issues are emotional in nature, is it even necessary to medicate? Well, here's the thing. I think that at some level, and again, Dr. Hammer says this, not just me personally, but according to what Dr. Hammer says, again, he was a medical doctor that discovered all this research, is that there is a role for medication, for uh, painkillers, for uh, antibiotics. Because again, even though the microbes are serving a purpose in the healing phase, if that's a big shock for many years, there's going to be a lot of bacterial activity in that healing phase. And those symptoms are going to be very severe and very uncomfortable. So taking medications, antibiotics, help decrease the intensity of our symptoms in the healing phase so that we can be comfortable while we're healing. So there is a role. And again, this is one of the things I want your audience to re realize is GNM is not like it's a natural versus medical sort of, you know, paradigm. This is something that technically should be integrated as the future of medicine, that this is how we now communicate. We don't break it down into separate parts. You come in and we're looking at you as a biological unit. So yes, it's more imperative that you understand that this so-called stomach infection or digestive infection is because you had an anger issue at work that was going on for five years, but now it's resolved because you got that promotion or you were, you're now in a new job. And so now it's intense symptoms. You could take whatever is prescribed by your doctor to help minimize those symptoms while you're healing and your understanding that this is related to that work issue should help you to, to alleviate um, or close that biological program quicker. So yes, uh, it's not a matter of, you know, well, then if it's all in your head, no, you still need what assistance, whether it's remedies, whether it's supplements, whether it's medication, whether it's hands-on therapy, whether it's uh, energy therapy, because those things help make you comfortable during the healing phase. While you, as the person going through the biological program, understands what it's about and you can actually help you know, make sure that that issue is closed, that you can let go of the fears, let go of the anger, let go of that fear of separation. Okay, so yes, it's, it's really a combination. Again, it really depends on what you need. I think the bottom line message that I want people to understand is that this is about self-empowerment. This is about you taking personal responsibility. This is about you knowing that intuitively, I know that I need to take this in order to get through this. Or intuitively, I know that I can handle it without anything because I, I know what my body needs. That's ultimately what it needs to come down to. GNM is just the, the foundational platform that allow, gives us the confidence to be able to make those kinds of intuitive decisions because there's a, a science that can verify the certainty that we have that our body is working with us during these symptoms. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing that up because in the intro, I introduced you as a chiropractor. And so I was curious, where does that get into the picture right now for you? Because if most health issues are source and emotional unease, 
is it even necessary to do physical adjustments to the Oh, spine? yes. Yes. So here's the thing that I need. And this is good because I'm actually working on um, in the new year, creating a way that I can teach this to practitioners. And in the beginning, I'm going to start with body workers, like people like massage therapists, physios, chiros, because you've got to remember that when somebody has neck pain, right, that came out of nowhere, again, we're not including physical trauma here. Like you just wake up, Dorit, tomorrow and you can't move your neck. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's killing me. I, you know, I didn't do anything yesterday. Why am I waking up with this neck pain? And automatically we're gonna think, oh, it must be your pillow, the way you slept, you know, you must have done something. Again, it's, it's like almost insulting to the body that the body doesn't know how to sleep, right? Even though you've slept a certain way your whole life, why is it only, you know, Tuesday morning you, you have neck pain? Well, knowing GNM now, we realize that, okay, neck pain has to do with an intellectual self-devaluation. That means before Tuesday, something happened unexpectedly and you perceived it as, I'm not being smart enough. I made a mistake. I was so stupid. That's not fair. And if you get the pain Tuesday morning, remember what we said, most of the symptoms come in the healing phase. That means Monday night, you resolved that issue. And so the way you work with this is that, when you look at, let's say on Sunday, your child tells you, mom, you forgot to sign this note and because you didn't sign it and give it to me, I can't go on the trip on you know, Friday. And now that's a shock to you, but by Monday you call the teacher and they say, no, don't worry, um, I'll make sure that she gets to go on a trip. You relax about it Monday, Tuesday morning, you wake up with the neck pain. That neck pain is there because there's actual changes happening to the tissues of the neck. When we devalue our neck, our intelligence, and it affects the neck, it's almost like we're telling, the brain is telling the body, you're not strong enough. This is too weak. Your intellect is too weak. You're making mistakes. So we need these muscles to tear and we need to rebuild them so that they're stronger and smarter than before. The stronger they are, the rebuilding process happens in the healing phase, similar to when you go to the gym, right? You haven't worked out ever. You're going to do a two-hour workout. You're tearing all the muscles in your body, but you're not going to feel it because of your adrenaline. Two days or three days after the gym, everything hurts, right? That's when there's swelling, there's pain. And the thing that's important here is that those are real changes happening to the tissues and the muscles. They're not imagined, oh, it's in your head that the pain's there. So having somebody that you can go to that will massage it, that will do acupuncture, that will do physiotherapy, chiropractic, uh, hands-on, craniosacral energy will actually help make these tissues more relaxed, improve circulation. So it will facilitate the healing. But only when you understand that this happened because of that issue where I felt I made a mistake regarding my daughter, will that neck pain go away quickly? Okay, because if you don't make that connection and you think it's your pillow, that neck pain could linger. Every time your daughter, uh, uh, you know, brings home something for you to sign at school, that could be a trigger. Every time there's a trip coming up, that could be a trigger. Every time you get a phone call from the teacher, that could be a trigger. And then now you go from having a short, quick biological program that co could have been done in one or two days to now it becomes a chronic neck issue that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, the Therapies that are available, again, this isn't a way to sort of incorporate GNM in what you're doing, but it's the foundation. You understand that my body's already in healing when you're going to your chiropractor or massage therapist, and that you already have worked on what the conflict was, but now they're going to put their hands on to help facilitate that healing and make you more comfortable. Right. So there's right. a role for almost every type of practitioner. It's just the way we have to... Uh, practice changes a little bit. So now when you get better in one or two days, it's not because of I have magic hands that made it go away. If you didn't come to me, it may have gone away because the issue is resolved. Do you see what I mean? So we start to come, we have to communicate a little bit differently with the patients so that they understand that, oh, my body was taking care of itself. I'm just coming to you so that you can facilitate it, make me feel better and more comfortable so I can go to work, so I can do what I need to do. And so that I don't keep rehashing that devaluation that I'm not smart enough, that I always make a mistake, that I'm a bad parent. And that avoids you having chronic neck issues. 
Right, right. So what I hear you saying that is that when a person understands that health approach, it helps them to actually heal faster, as opposed to, you know, this, whatever it is, to turn to turn into uh, something chronic that Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the thing that I always say, right? Like if you uh, are, you know, your child starts having stomach digestive issues and you think it's the milk, you think it's the gluten, you think it's the sugar, you're going on a whole other path that is now, you know, going to lead to chronic issues with their stomach, which means now every meal becomes potentially stressful for that child. And now they worry about, oh, can I eat this? Does that have milk? Oh, I don't want to eat that because it makes my stomach hurt. So you go down a whole other path. And usually I see those kids when they're 20 or 19 in my clinic because they've had this issue since they were seven, right? If you understand what GNM is about, you would go to like, okay, what happened at seven that made you angry? And I had this one case where she was diagnosed for three months in and out of sick kids hospital here in Toronto, right? World renowned hospital. And they told her she has severe lactose intolerance and the mother couldn't believe it because it's like, wow, she drinks like two chocolate milks a day. Normally, like how is it all of a sudden at seven years old, she can't tolerate milk. And uh, when I asked the child knowing about GM, I said, something must've happened at seven years old. Cause she was around nine by, or eight. By the time she saw me, I said, what made you, what happened unexpectedly that made you angry? And she says, oh, I know what it is. That's the year my dad died in a car accident. And I was like, oh my gosh. So that's a shock. And she perceived it as an anger. So do you see what I mean? And a lot of the times her symptoms, she said, used to happen at night before bed, where she'd wake up in the middle of the night with pain and diarrhea. And I asked her, why is it that at night, you know, you get triggered thinking about your dad? And she told me that it's because at night when I say my prayers, I feel like that's when I miss him the most. Mm. And so you could see how, Really, that conversation, you know, can give her relief knowing that it's not the milk necessarily or the dairy. It's the fact that losing my dad made me angry when I found out about that shock, you know, a year ago. So this connection, this awareness helps relax the psyche and it helps potentially change uh, or stop the changes in the brain and in the organs so that you can resolve that conflict quicker. Oh, this is so great. I cannot believe more people don't know about this. Yeah, I mean, you know what? It's, it's, I felt everybody feels the same way when they first learn it. But here's the, here's the reason why. Originally, Dr. Hammer taught it only in German and then only in German and Spanish and then Italian. And so the English-speaking community, all of his work only got translated into English around 2007. And really, that's who I learned from. One of Dr. Hammer's students, Carolina Marklin, who actually did the translations into English. So I feel very lucky. I got exposed to this in 2008, 2009, and it was only in English for like maybe less than two years. So this is why most people in North America, most people around the world in the English speaking world have not actually heard of it. So it's understandable. And yes, my goal is hopefully people get exposed to it, people start again. It's one thing to hear this and think, oh, that's kind of cool. It's another thing, like, like you mentioned, you and your husband doing, actually applying it in your day-to-day -day life. Look for it. The next time you have a symptom, the next time your child has a symptom, think about what was going on that could have been unexpected, ask them. Sometimes for kids, it's just a change in routine. It doesn't have to be a big shock. These things don't have to be like a death or a divorce. It could just be that, you know, they're used to, um, your mother-in-law babysitting them on weekends and then your mother-in-law moves back to the, her native country. She was only here for six months and now she's back there. And now they could miss their mother-in-law and that could lead to their chronic symptoms showing up when their routine on the weekend changes. So watch for that and see if you can address that, if there can be changes in their symptoms. I have uh, one more question for you. I mean, I have more questions, <laughs> but this one I have to ask. What do you do when, so I understand you, you know, you ask the patient, you know, what happened at seven or what happened you know, at whatever age. Well, what happens when the patient doesn't remember? Like how yeah, and that's, I mean, it's a common, common question. So here's the thing. I really believe that there's only two reasons why somebody maybe won't remember, right? One is that it's actually, we, I have not created a safe enough space for them to feel comfortable because you got to remember, usually, usually it's that first visit. You know, we spend about 90 minutes with people on that first visit. 
and it might be the first time they're ever meeting me. And so if I haven't made them feel comfortable enough to be able to share with me, I mean, some of the more intimate details of their lives that perhaps I'm the only person even bringing it up. Okay. Like, and this is the thing. If I haven't created a safe enough space, I believe that's one of the reasons they don't want to go there. They'll say, no, everything's fine. There's no, and I think it's just because maybe I haven't been conscious enough. I haven't been present enough to make them feel comfortable to open up, you know, to, to me with whatever's going on in their marriage, with their work, with their financial situation, you know, they may not be willing to go there. So that's one reason I haven't created that safe enough space for them to really think about it. They know what it is. They just don't want to, you know, bring it up in that visit. Another reason is that it's a protective thing where it could be something significantly traumatic for them that they have buried over here somewhere. I know it's there, but I don't want to dig it up because it's too, it's going to bring up too much for me. And so we have to be very careful about that because if it's something that's gone on for 20, 30 years, right? And it's an intense conflict shock. You can imagine, as we said, in the healing phases, when the symptoms show up, and usually those symptoms are proportionate to the intensity of the shock and the, how long the shock is. So sometimes we might not bring that up. We may leave that back there. If, as long as they know something happened there that we can relate to what they're dealing with now, they may, we may not have to dig that up if they say that, depending on how severe or how bad the symptom is affecting your day-to-day life. Okay, so those are really two reasons when people say, but I have to be honest with you, I'd have to say like nine out of 10 people, maybe nine and a half out of 10 people, oh, we can always find the conflict. And I don't know if that's just my own skill set, you know, that there's an art to asking the questions. So I, I get to ask, um, you know, I, I've sort of learned how to navigate, how to ask the questions to, to prompt a response or, or, or a memory, um, or it's just my confidence and certainty that, that I'm very confident and certain that like, you know, I, I know that it has to be something to happen at eight years old because you know that eight is you definitely had symptoms at eight that summer and before that you didn't have any i won't let that go so i will go into like what was going on with your family what was going on with your grandparents what was going on with school what was going on with your teachers and and again a lot of it's very intuitive like i just get a feeling and it's so funny how many times i'll bring up an example and they'll say oh my gosh that's exactly my story and and i think a lot of it is just i really try to tune in to their energy and sometimes that example pops in my head and it's relevant to what they're dealing with. So, you know, for me personally, I mean, I can't speak for other GNM practitioners. I really feel like nine times more than nine times out of 10, we're able to help them figure out the conflict. The times that we're not, it's one of those two reasons. I haven't created a safe enough space so they don't wanna really share it with me or um, it's something significantly traumatic that's probably best left you know, buried over there because of the potential for severe symptoms that will come up as they resolve or recall it. Yeah. And I think that is the real, like you said, it's an art. That is the real job or work of a healer, of someone who facilitates that kind of understanding for people. And I think it's, it's brilliant what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, thanks. It's, it's, I, I feel like it's actually matched up well with so, my natural, um, what comes natural to me. I think my background in psychology definitely helps, but um, I'm not your typical, like, I'm not just going to sit there and say, oh, so tell me how you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Like, I talk a lot, as you can hear, and you know, so you, I make interviews very easy, but I feel like what I'm saying, or as I'm talking, people are listening and thinking and it actually stimulates a memory for them. Yes. So I think I've sort of had that natural talent, if you want to call it that my whole life where, you know, if I don't care about anything, I I don't talk a lot when I'm talking about something though, oftentimes it, it stimulates something in people to think about something relevant to them. So it, it makes it almost easier for them to hear or to bring up something based on the, the ex- examples or what I'm talking about. So again, I don't know whether I've been able to, to un- unlock that or not. I mean, that's what's helped me over the last nine years of, of using this anyways. Right. So I also wanted to ask you about febrile seizures. I know it's not really related to GNM specifically, but you know, as you know, two of my kids had them and I know that they're not da- dangerous, but still, can you talk about what parents can do to prevent them? 
Or okay. even maybe if you can, even if you can address what to do in, when kids have a fever. Okay, so here's the thing. The thing with febrile seizures, and again, it took me a while to really understand it because I thought we were doing everything right. But in GNM, because we're looking at each person, each child as a psyche, a brain, and an organ, really you start to learn that most of this quote-unquote serious conditions are events that are taking place at the brain level. You know, the brain is the most important part of the body. It's the reason that it's completely encased in bone. Uh, you know, people might think the heart's important, the nervous system, yes, but the brain really makes everything go. And so it's the most protective part of the body. And so what Dr. Hammer found was that when we go into healing, in the healing phase, fluid will go to the area that's healing to protect it. So if you're angry and you're not angry anymore, you resolve the anger, you're going to get fluid going in your stomach, you're going to get bloating, cramping, diarrhea, vomiting. But fluid is also going to go to the part of the brain that controls the stomach. Now, because of the fluid going into the brain, and if that impact was big versus a small impact from a small shock versus a big shock, there's going to be a lot of potential fluid going in the brain. And when there's a lot of fluid going to a particular area of the brain, that's going to lead to potential complications. And this is why in GNM, there's this thing, you know, we talked about the two phases, the conflict active phase, then the healing phase. In the middle of the healing phase, when the swelling in the brain gets too big, there's this thing called an epicrisis. An epileptoid crisis or an epileptic crisis is really uh, a counter-regulatory mechanism that the body undergoes in order to get that fluid out of the body, to squeeze it out to protect the brain. Now, an epicrisis can look very scary because in order for the body to do this, the person will have to faint or pass out. So fainting is an epicrisis, a stroke, a heart attack, an asthma attack, uh, a seizure, are all epicrises. So it's the body's way to protect the brain because too much fluid has happened there so that the person will collapse and it could be shaking. The seizure tells us that it's maybe uh, the motor cortex of the brain is affected. So that could be where the conflict is. It has to do with the child feeling stuck or any conflict near the motor cortex. If the swelling is too big, it pushes into the motor cortex, which will cause an epileptic uh, type seizure in the healing phase, in the epicrisis. After the epicrisis, when that fluid is squeezed out, you enter phase B of healing, the, the person or child is going to be fatigued, and there's going to be a urinary phase. They're going to pee, or they're going to wet themselves. And, you know, if you've ever witnessed somebody having a seizure or a stroke or a heart attack, a lot of times when they come to, they might wet themselves on the spot, or they've got to go to the bathroom. And that's that release of that fluid in the brain. So knowing all of this, number one, you don't panic because you understand it's a, it's a mechanism that's needed to squeeze that fluid out. One of the things that we can do is to put ice packs in the head or cold cloths because we all know from a physiological standpoint that when there's swelling, we put cold or ice, it will decrease the blood vessels to reduce the swelling. So you can reduce the swelling in the brain in order to minimize potential, you know, uh, severe uh, epicrisis because yes can somebody still you know pass away or die from like a heart attack or uh, a really severe stroke of course if there's a massive impact and that person goes into healing that's a lot of fluid there you combine that with the person having a water retention at the same time so that has to do with what we know is a kidney collecting tubule program or an abandonment program. So they're retaining water. So now you have extra fluid going to that area that's healing. That could be fatal. So again, knowing GNM, we understand that it's the brain we have to protect. So one of the things that we can do whenever our kids are having a fever or, or not feeling well in general, which we do a lot, is we put ice packs on the head. So if they're an infant or a baby, we didn't use ice packs. We would get a cloth, run it in cold water, bring it out and then place it on their head while you're cuddling with the child. So, you know, comforting close to mom, especially so that they don't feel abandoned is a big uh, part of the healing phase and anything cold in the head to reduce any swelling in that area from a genome perspective is going to be one of the most helpful things that you can do uh, to reduce the impact of the healing phase. So those, you know, for parents that are listening, I mean, again, from Dr. Hammer's research, from what he's saying, using ice packs to the head during any healing phase uh, could be beneficial in reducing the significance of those symptoms. But that now goes to explain 
like your kids or, or my son, that epicrisis has to do with there must have been a shock. Either they felt stuck or it was somewhere, an impact somewhere close to the motor cortex. They resolved it, the swelling, because again, I didn't know about this with my son, so he was laying flat a lot of the times when he was sick. Now that you know, you keep them a little bit reclined or upright, so gravity helps to drain that extra fluid, and then we always put ice packs on their head. So once I learned this, my son hasn't really had another, he's never had another seizure since. And, and it's just every time they get sick or, you know, they're dealing with something, there's the ice pack in the, uh, on the head. So we have gel packs, like at least three, four, five of them in our freezers all the time. So that's one thing that you can start doing. Perhaps go buy a gel pack if you don't have one. Or like I said, just a cold cloth that you could run over cold water and wring it out and then put it on their head. And the funny thing is with babies or infants, you'll notice that they will let you put it on. Like it soothes them because it decreases the brain pressure because right. of the cold. And then when they don't want it anymore, after three or four times of changing it and putting another one on, they'll move it out. And it's funny, the moment they don't want it anymore, you'll feel their temperature and it's almost like their fever starts to break. So it's amazing to, to see that it's almost like the child knows that they need it. So then they don't fuss when you put it on initially uh, until they get used to it. And then after a while, they don't want it anymore because they're probably fine. Oh, so a lot of information yeah. to try to uh, <laughs> process. And I know it's going to be very different for a lot of your audience and what they're hearing. This is why, you know, I encourage them to read about it, learn more about it, uh, and then test it out. I mean, really the next time there's a symptom, look yeah. and, and really try to, um, you know, confirm it for yourself. Yeah. And guys, I can attest to that. I've been, uh, this is what I've been using and since I've learned it and it actually works. It actually works. So Alvin, I know my audience is comprised of bright and curious people and parents who will be intrigued by this approach for sure. And they'll immediately start Googling and researching about it. So I just wanted you to comment on what the skeptics say about this approach and Dr. Hama's research, research so that we eliminate this you know, confusion. And skepticism. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Yes. So of course, I mean, just like anything that is going to be revolutionary, um, I had to deal with some of the things that, um, you know, if you Google it, you look up, there's Wikipedia write-ups, there's all sorts of things that are really discrediting and, uh, and really, um, you know, almost it's like a character assassination on Dr. Hammer. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that when Dr. Hammer found out about the research and he tried to get the University of Tübingen, where he was a medical doctor at, to do a postdoctoral thesis on it, they didn't want to do the research. And so, which was unheard of at the time, Dr. Hammer had to get the university um, to follow with a court, he had to get a court order to try to force the university to do the research and they just wouldn't touch it. And a lot of the things that were happening at that time was that Dr. Hammer was um, confirming the research with groups of medical doctors, uh, cardiologists, certain people treating certain cancers, and they would test it out. They would look at the brain scans, they would confirm it. And every time he did that, it was being verified, like you're 100% accurate, this is 100% correct. And he was even telling um, some of these doctors based on the brain scan what their patients presented with without knowing what, you know, never meeting the patient and giving those doctors more information than they learned about the patient. So it was a real threat to the industry at that time. Uh, and one of the things that really makes this or what really slowed the, prog the progress of GNM and why it's not, you know, your average practitioner doesn't know about it is somewhere around the 80s, Dr. Hammer apparently got wind of the fact that in Israel, Jewish medical doctors were using GNM to treat Jewish cancer patients. But if they were not Jewish, they were being treated with conventional medicine, conventional treatments. And that really angered Dr. Hammer because apparently there was evidence of this and there was proof that this was being done. And he fought against it, saying, like, this isn't right. This is meant for the world. This is not just for, you know, Jewish patients. Now, obviously, there's clips of him ranting about this that's all over YouTube or something, which now puts him in the light of being anti-Semitic. That, like, here's a guy that, you know, hates the Jews and this whole thing. And so that's now come up as a way to sort of attack Dr. Hammer's character. And so there's been so many roadblocks like this. And, and again, having learned directly 
from his inner circle. So I never met Dr. Hammer, but I, I met a few of the people within his inner circle that actually worked with him in those early years that he taught how to read brain scans that, you know, I, I visited in Austria. And, you know, once you get the real story behind it, for me, it's kind of, um, it's ironic because here we have research that will revolutionize our entire view of health. I mean, globally, it's a real potential shift that can happen, but it's, it's sort of mired. It's sort of like, you know, uh, scattered with all of this controversy and politics. And, and so it's almost like I've come to appreciate that it's going to take a person that's willing to go beyond the superficial sort of stuff that you're going to read and the ability to confirm it for yourself. You know, and I tell people all the time, it's like the sweetest nectar of the best fruit in the world is hidden amongst thorns and it's covered by thorns. And so only a few people that are willing to get cut and bruised to reach in there to go beyond all the external stuff will get to really taste the sweetness of that nectar. And I really believe that's what GNM is. It's, it will revolutionize the future of medicine. I have no doubt whether that's going to happen you know, in one or two or three generations, it's going to take its time. But I really believe we're on the cutting edge. We're in the first 40 years of a pioneered, pioneering shift in how we're going to look at health. And, and I feel very privileged to be part of that. And I feel very honored that I was able to sort of like sift through all of the politics, get at that fruit and, and use it. You know, I cannot deny what I've seen every single day in my clinical practice um, the results, the case studies that I've, that I've published and posted. And so for me, if you're hearing this and you're going to Google it and you're going to see all this negative things out there, which is understandable, like it, it will be out there. And it's almost like the only way to discredit Dr. Hammer's research was to go after him because the research, anybody that has the scientific mind to actually take the time to learn it and confirm it and validate it the research is untouchable. I mean, there's so many things that I've learned in 15 years of practice, um, modalities and techniques that are wild, widely accepted, that have so many holes in it that they, the instructors can't even ask, answer your questions when you're challenging it, right? And I haven't found that in, in nine years with GNM. And so that's what's built my own confidence on top of my clinical experience. So, you know, I encourage those of you that are listening Yes, it's not going to be something that, you know, everyone's just jumped on. If it's so great, why isn't everyone using it? Well, you have to ask yourself, you know, is the world ready to change the way we're dealing with health right now when you have to face the economic implications of, you know, a natural healthcare industry that is, you know, billion dollar industry or more and in the food drug uh, uh, industry and in the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a lot of economic implications you know, but I think you've just got to learn it, see if it feels right for you, if the timing's right, and then you've got to test it. Like, don't even listen to me. Don't listen to door. I mean, do your own work. Be the expert of your own body, your families, and, and take that responsibility. And, and I really think once you look at the world this way, you will never look back again. I mean, you, it's hard to look at things. Um, I'm sure Dort can attest to that the yeah. way you used to look at it before yeah. you got exposed to this. A hundred percent. Yeah. All right, Alvin. So I have a few more questions that I ask all of my guests Perfect. and they're usually geared toward women, but, but I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious to have a male perspective on these. Are you ready? Awesome. Yep. All right. So what is your perspective on self care? What are some of your daily ritual r daily rituals that help you show up as the best version of yourself? Awesome. Wow. Self-care. Okay. So for me, one of the main things, you know, knowing what I've known in the last little while, again, coming from a natural health um, uh, field, my main focus lately really has been on my mental health, my mental strength, my ability to be emotionally flexible, to, to be able to, you know, adapt a, a, to anything that shows up. And so one of the main things that I really focus on uh, every day as often as possible is, is, dedicating time for silence. Like that's been a big thing for me because I really find that, you know, whether it's in an official meditative time or whether it's just like, I do not speak or listen to anything for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes so that I can really tune in. I really believe that 
you and I and everybody else out there listening have a resource of untapped potential to be able to connect to the universal consciousness within them. And I believe that the external noise that we're exposed to every day really um, you know, hinders our ability to listen to those whispers of intuitiveness and, and inspiration that I believe you always know what the next thing is for you to do. You always know what your body needs. You always know what you should do for your child. But the noise takes away from that. And so, you know, for me, one of the biggest things is definitely um, daily moments. I, I spend at least 20, 30 minutes in the morning by myself before I have my coffee or while I'm having my coffee, just sitting in silence. Sometimes it's in an official meditation or sometimes I'll just be um, contemplating, <laughs> right? And then other times it'll be at night, you know, the kids have gone to bed. Again, I'll come down to the basement and just sit there and process my day and just sit in the silence. Uh, and I find that that's something that from a self-care perspective is really, really important. Um, in terms of, you know, your mental health and, and you getting that confidence and certainty about knowing what your body needs. So that's really my main thing. I, I'm very flexible, like certain days I'll go for my walks and other times I'll, you know, another thing actually more recently that I've been doing is at least uh, once or twice a week where I'll do an extended sort of, um, not a complete fast where I might not eat till 2 p.m. just to sort of have that, again, uh, self-discipline to know that, you know, uh, I'm fine. I, I don't have to follow this sort of like three times, three meals a day. I got to make sure I have a big breakfast. I mean, there's once or twice a week, I'll do it where like, you know what, tomorrow's going to be a, a, a fat, an extended fast from, you know, the last meal before bed. I may not eat to two or three um, later that day, just to sort of get my body uh, in tune again with feeling like I have to rely on, on the food to function. So those are a couple of things that I work that work on. All right. Second question. I like to keep it real and show listeners that even though someone is an expert in one area, they might be struggling with other things. So what are some of your current challenges as a man, husband, or a father? Oh, I'd have to say for sure it's as a father. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a daily struggle um, and it's a daily challenge figuring out uh, parenting. I mean, you know, I think your audience can totally um, recognize that probably within themselves. Like I, it's funny because it comes across as if like, well, here's the right thing you need to teach your kids or how you need to raise your kids. But I'm it's a constant work in progress. So I lose it on my kids. I, you know, snap and, and I'm irrational and, you know, all those things. So, but the difference for me is I think I'm conscious of what I'm doing. I don't feel good about it when I do it, but I'm at least conscious of it, which allows me instead of, you know, minutes or hours or days of like having to like feel bad afterwards, like within seconds of it happening, I'm able to be conscious of what that really meant for me and, and sort of bring it back. But definitely parenting to me is an everyday challenge. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's for all of us. <laughs> but the good thing is that they are, you know, our kids are so much more resilient than what we think. Um, and I mean, like you practicing GNM every single day, you know how the body and the mind is so strong and flexible. And so, you know. But you're right. And this is why I know that when I do lose it, I'm watching for like, do they get a symptom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right away, it's like, oh, okay, they're fine. <laughs> it, right? And I always yeah. tell people, I always tell myself and my wife, it's like, listen, you're always going to get another chance to, to, yes. to that. Because like your kids give you plenty of opportunity to learn and to get better as a parent. So, yeah. you know, if it's patience, you're going to get another time to, to, to display more patience. So it's, it, you know, it's just putting it in perspective. Right. All right. Third question. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I'm so fascinated by you and by, by your work. So third question, why do you want, what do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? Whew. You know, I, I've actually thought about this um, because I, I sometimes try to process like, why am I putting all this effort into this? And I think, you know, at some level, I think I just want to believe that I was part of a huge movement in shifting something globally. Like I really believe that at, on one end, you know, we all have this 
internal capacity to make a dent in the universe. You know, like, like there's something within you, if you can unlock it and things align properly and you get lucky, you're going to make a dent in the universe. Every single one of us has that potential. But on the flip side, I try not to get caught up in that. And I realize like, I'm a grain of sand. Like I'm a nobody. No, you know, the majority of the world doesn't even know who I am and and aren't going to care about me. So I try to live in that, in that balanced perspective. But in terms of legacy, I'd like to believe that, you know, I was part of something that really made a dent in the universe. Like I, I feel good to know that, you know, I squeezed everything out of myself to be able to, to contribute to that. And serve the world. Yeah, I love that. All right, Alvin, any last advice for parents? Well, um, you know what, Dor and everybody listening right now, I really think the main focus uh, with the knowledge of GNM is understanding about adaptability understanding about emotional flexibility that the key to health and longevity lies in your ability to change your expectations to change your mind and and i believe that the sooner that you can teach your children about you know what this is how you wanted it to go it didn't go the way you, you expected what are you going to do how are you going to adapt to that the sooner they they have that ability to adapt to things that don't go their way, let go of that expectation and change their mind, I think the more successful and and the better off they're going to be moving forward just in life in general. So that's my final thing. Get comfortable with changing your mind and letting go of those expectations so you can adapt. Mm. All right. So before I let you go, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Where can they connect with you? Where can people learn more about GNM? All of that. Yes, so definitely from uh, the English uh, website on GNM is learninggnm.com. I've actually got uh, about 64 case studies on there. Uh, that has all the information. As you know, Dorit, there's so much in there. It can yeah. be overwhelming. So, but it is the resource center for GNM in the English speaking community. So, definitely, those of you interested, uh, go to the study guideline on that website so you can start your journey on learning more about this. Uh, for me, to connect with me, I've got my website, dralvindillion.com. Uh, please register uh, for my Adapters Digest newsletter that comes out every Monday. I think it just came out sometime earlier this morning. Uh, yeah. where I try to give you tidbits of information, videos, clips, um, just to enhance your knowledge and continue to bring you value in terms of how to bring GNM and personal... How to apply it, yeah. That's yeah, in your life. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the newsletter from my website. And then you can just follow me on uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Twitter. I've, I'm, I'm on all those as uh, Dr. Alvin DeLeon, I believe. And there I'm just posting one-minute little videos. Again, just introducing it to people, uh, certain conditions. I'm also on YouTube now, so you can follow some of those YouTube uh, videos to um, you know take what's on the website and give it to you in bite-size sort of two, three-minute clips to make it easier for you to apply. Alvin, this has been such a pleasure, such an honor. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I know that this is not easy. (laughs) Yes, do it. I know, I know. I know, I can't believe it's been three years uh, since we first met. and, And, you know, it's been amazing. I'm glad to hear that you've been uh, benefiting from the information and that it's changed your, uh, yes. Your oh my gosh. It definitely changed our lives. And you know, just my conversation with my husband and like everything became so, I don't know, much more relaxed, you know, even this, <laughs> this, even this food situation, you know, and that's what I'm trying to pass on to parents, you know, stop, stressing so much about food it's not the reason this is not where you know that's not the cause of you know whatever distress you're going through you or your child are going through so thank you so much and i hope to catch with you and yes soon. yes definitely Dort. thank you for doing this uh you know you're doing great work keep it up and uh i hope that the, your audience is you know continue to benefit from the the wisdom you're sharing uh, with everything that you're learning. And, and it's been a pleasure to, uh, to be you. part of the, the podcast. So thank you. Thanks again, Dora. We'll be in touch. <laughs> yes. Thank you for listening to the Health Begins with Mom show. I love hearing from you. So please post your comments and questions over at healthbeginswithmom.com 
forward slash podcast. If you love the show, please share it on social media and in your real life with other moms who might enjoy this content. And if you have a burning question or topic you'd like me to hit on the show, just drop me a line at dorit at healthbeginswithmom.com. And if you love the show and really want to support it, please go to iTunes, write a review and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you next time. Much love and many blessings.